Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. We're back on the PM Research steam engine today, and we're going to make an iconic part on any steam engine. That's the flywheel. This is one of those parts that I thought was going to be straightforward, turned out to be pretty unusually interesting. So stay tuned for that. And by the way, if you're wondering how to watch all the videos in this series, check out my playlists, or there's a link to the playlist for this entire build at the end of every video. Okay, let's go. For months now, you've seen this casting sitting on the back of my workbench. Well, finally, it's moment to shine. A quick inspection here, and no disrespect to this kit, it's a great kit, but this casting is pretty rough. You can see that it's actually flash rusted, unlike all the other castings, because of the roughness, and it looks like it's going to be tough to machine. Let's compare it to a more traditional model steam engine casting. It looks like this. You'd hold it on the outside, you'd drill and bore the center of the hub there, and then you'd mount it on something like this, which is a tapered mandrel that has centers in the ends and flats, so you can mount it between centers, drive it with a dog, and then you mount the flywheel on that mandrel, turn the OD, everything is concentric, Bob's your uncle. However, I don't think that's going to work here because this is a very large diameter flywheel with a very small hub. So the flywheel has a lot of leverage on that hub and we're asking then those delicate spokes to take all of the machining forces. So I really don't think that's going to work well. Instead, I am going to bring in something completely different. The faceplate. Now this is not something you've seen me use much or possibly at all on the Blondie Hacks YouTube channel. This is a very rare thing for me to use, but I busted it out for this occasion because I think it'll be just the thing. Check if it's running okay since I've, I think, only used it once or twice on this lathe. And uh, it looks like it's running within a few tenths there on the face. And uh, well, that's good news, so it's at least in decent shape. Now there's some surface roughness there that you can see in the needle, so I decided to take my precision ground flat stones and just deburr this thing. So my goal is to mount it on the faceplate like this, and then the faceplate is going to be taking all of the machining forces, and the spindly casting isn't going to be doing any heavy lifting here. Now the question is, how do I mount it on there? I need some way to mount it such that I have access to the OD, the face, and all of the hub area. So really just the spokes and the inner rim there are up for grabs. So I might be able to do some kind of through bolting scheme like this. So I decided to try my hand at that first. I got some scrap here and I whipped up a set of little pins that are threaded in the center, have a shoulder on them and some wrench flats on the outside as such. Nice thing about the faceplate is that it's easy to remove and set on the bench for fixturing so that I'm not fighting gravity here while I try to figure out how to do this. So I've got some blocks here that'll act as supports for a strap clamping style action here. Now we have some small bolts and big slots here to deal with and well, like any half-baked fixturing idea, the solution is stacks and stacks of washers. That's exactly where I wanted those. I've got some little pieces of copper here to protect the casting from the steel pins and the idea is that the pins will go through there, clamp between the casting and the blocks there, and then I can tighten into the threads from the back using the stack of ridiculous washers. So multiply that by four, and here is the setup. I'll start by dialing in the OD, although that's not actually what matters, as you'll see here in a moment, but I'm just tapping this in as best I can. And this seems like it should be pretty straightforward. I made good progress here, and I got it to within about 15 thou. But here's the important lesson about machining flywheels. The concentricity of the OD and the hub don't actually matter nearly as much as you think. Obviously they need to be machined concentric so that the mass is balanced when it spins, but visually it will look like it's running out no matter how concentric all of your machining is, unless the cast details in the center are running as visually true as you can get them, within the imperfections of a casting, of course. So this is the real trick to getting a nice looking flywheel. If you don't indicate in the cast details that won't be machined, then the flywheel will look like it's wobbling when it's running, even if everything is machined perfectly concentric. So with it roughly dialed in on the OD, I switched to the ID, and I'm now indicating on that fillet in the casting there on the inside rim, which is a little tricky, but can be done. Now, this was going fine until right about here, where I was tapping, 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 nothing was moving anymore. I had about 10 thou I needed, and I couldn't get it. And here's the problem. The pins are bottoming out on the slots in the face plate there. And because of the slope of the casting here, there's nowhere for that copper to go. So I've run out of room to move the casting and it's not yet concentric. Now, 
I tried 20 different arrangements of the pins and different positions on the spokes and loosening and tightening things and there was just no position that I could find where I could tap it in concentric. So that's usually a sign that something's wrong with your fixture. If you're fighting it that much and you can't get it to work, it's probably the wrong fixture. So I switched to this approach instead. Two brass bars clamped on the spokes. Much simpler, not as secure, mind you, as you'll see here later, but this was quite easy to dial in using the same method and I had little difficulty. And the caveat here is that the spokes are tapered in all three dimensions. So as you're tapping in the part, the clamping bars can get looser or tighter depending on where they land on those tapers. So you gotta keep a close eye on those bolts and tighten them as needed or if you can't get it to move, loosen them a little bit and then tighten it again and, and work your way up until you've got it concentric and all the bolts are tight. So this is where I landed. We'll spin it up here, see how it looks. And I feel pretty good about this. The key is to focus your eye on the innermost circumference of the outer rim of the wheel, because that's what we're trying to dial in. The hub and the OD and everything else is gonna run out and it's gonna look bad. And it's easy to think that the thing isn't concentric. Again, this is a rough casting, so there's no position where all of those different surfaces are all gonna be concentric. The only one we care about is that circumference on the inner portion of the outer rim because everything else is getting machined. The next interesting challenge with this flywheel is access because it's such a large diameter for my little lathe. So one trick I'm using a lot on this is rotating the compound around. So I'm using it at 90 degrees and I'm even using it pointing towards the operator, all sorts of different positions to get extra reach here on the cross slide. So now I can come in and start machining the scale. Now you can see as soon as I start doing this, the wheel has shifted to where it's running out again. And this is because that hard scale is banging into the tool and it's causing the wheel to shift. And that's okay, we just need to get through this scale and then we can dial it in again. So as I go, I'm kind of checking here. And if it's moved too terribly off, then I tap it in again. But again, before the finishing pass, I'll make sure that it's very dialed in. Taking light cuts on this scale is very hard on the tool and it's slow going, but there really isn't a lot of option. You know, the conventional wisdom on machine castings is your first cut should be deep enough to go under the scale, but there isn't enough rigidity in the setup or the part to do that, nor do I have enough material to remove to where I have that luxury. You know, we're trying to basically just remove the scale and not really go any deeper than that. So we don't have a lot of choice except to chisel our way through it the hard way. I'm using high speed steel here because a carbide tool is just going to immediately chip and it's just setting $5 bills on fire. So I've resigned myself to resharpening the tool as we go here and I did resharpen all these tools about twice during this machining. Quick sidebar on steam engine flywheel geometry. Now traditionally the flywheel is also the drive pulley for whatever work you want the steam engine to do and so you would want to machine a two or three degree crown on this surface so that a flat belt can run on it and it will track in the center of the pulley without sliding off. Now this flywheel however is very narrow and very very large diameter for this engine. Much too large to actually do any useful work for the horsepower of this engine. So if I want to drive something, and I will be driving things with this engine, just you wait. It will need a separate power takeoff pulley elsewhere on the crankshaft that's smaller diameter and that will have a crown machined on it for a flat belt. If I were to do this again I might just take a Dremel and sand most of the scale off the OD before machining this thing. Eh, live and learn. Put a little perseverance and we do get through it and now I can machine the front face here. The front face is not quite as bad scale wise as the OD. The OD was really bad. It was like this casting was just wrapped in glass. It was so hard. I don't know if it was chilled or what but the OD on this thing was really tough. I was mighty glad for power cross feed on this step though because the RPM is fairly low because of the large diameter and so you want to be feeding very very slowly and so the power cross feed takes a lot of the tedium out of this. In addition to all the scale, the OD on this thing had a lot of inclusions and other roughness. So I had kind of had to decide how deep do I want to go? Which inclusions am I just going to have to leave there? Which ones am I going to try to machine out? A lot of judgment calls here, but I got to where the surface looked pretty good. And now I squared up my tool post and come in with the chamfering tool and put a, a delicate chamfer on that edge there. Just kind of clean it up and make it feel nice to the touch. With that chamfer on there, it's really starting to look like a flywheel now. It's looking pretty good. Now, the next little secret here is I'm going to chamfer the inside edge here where the fillet of the casting meets the machined face. By cleaning up the roughness here and getting it as concentric as we can without cutting too deep, it really again helps the flywheel look like it isn't wobbling when it runs. 
What I like about this setup is that I can machine almost every surface on this flywheel in one setup. So onto the hub now. I don't know who CB is, but apologies, I'm about to machine off your maker's mark. Now I talked about how rough and hard the casting was on the outside of this thing. The inside, the hub, is a completely different story. In here it was beautiful. Very little scale, very easy to machine, just cut like butter. So clearly the outside of this casting had some difficulty, like it was chilled or didn't fill very well, something like that. With the hub faced, I'm going to machine the side of the hub, which is not strictly called for in the drawing, but I think it's going to look a lot better, so I'm going to give it a shot here. So I'm going to bring my boring bar in here. I'm going to make sure that it clears my fixture here. It's pretty tight in there, and I'm going to figure out how deep to go, just sort of to where I'm just touching all the spokes. And then the key here is I got to run the lathe backwards, unless you have a left-handed boring bar or you'd have to grind a special tool to do this operation on the other side of the hub here. And just like the face, the sides of the hub machined beautifully. No trouble here at all, even with the skinny boring bar sticking way out to clear my daredevil fixturing there. You can see here how the more surfaces get machined, the less wobbling there appears to be in the flywheel. So it'll just get better as we go here. More compound shenanigans now to get the reach in there to get to the side of the hub with my chamfer tool. And one of the reasons I'm using the compound so much is that the carriage is going to hit the faceplate if I don't. There's not a lot of clearance under there, and that's something you really got to watch, because if you're used to using a chuck, the carriage can't hit that, at least not on this lathe. So you might not be in the mindset of thinking about where the front of your carriage is. It's very easy to hit the faceplate and not think about it. On to the bore now. This is as close to the spindle as my tailstock has ever been. I'll start by center drilling this, and again, we don't have to worry about concentricity with the outer rim because nothing's moved since the OD was turned, so everything's going to be concentric, all one setup. That's the secret here. So I'm drilling this up in a couple of stages, and then I'm going to come in with a reamer. You could also bore this if you wanted it to be super, super concentric, but this is going to be just fine, I think. And then a little chamfer deburring action there. Some inclusions there in the hub, as you can see. This casting is definitely uh, one of the more challenging ones. Do a little test fit here with the crankshaft, which is where this is ultimately going to live, and that's a good fit there. I'm happy with that. Before I take this down, I'm going to measure the hub diameter so I can match it on the other side. The actual dimension doesn't matter. I just want it to be symmetrical, and I measure the depth as well. Now I can pull the fixture bars off of here, clean up the faceplate. It's covered in cast iron grit flip the flywheel over, and now with those machined surfaces on the faceplate, we can machine all the features on the other side, and we'll know that they will be parallel. Now I'm going to dial in the OD, which is quite easy now that it's machined. I've got it within a few tenths there, and I want to check the hub as well. I don't have a gauge pin this size, but I do have an end mill that's the right size for that, so I'll indicate on that. And actually the hub is even better than the OD, so that's down to surface finish, I imagine. The hub there is pretty much dead nuts, hard to complain about that. Okay, so now I have to machine the outer edge here a little bit again, because obviously I didn't machine the OD all the way into the faceplate before, because I would have hit the faceplate. So I was stopping 10 thou short, and then I just had to clean up that edge. And of course, as soon as I hit that crust, it shifted again, and I had to dial it back in again. And once the crust was gone, I could do one very light cut all the way across. And because the backside is chamfered, as long as the chamfer is bigger than the nose radius on this tool, I can go all the way across without touching the faceplate. And then more compound shenanigans to get the chamfer tool in there, chamfer this edge, same as the other side. And I also chamfered the inside cast rim there as well, just like before. So that's starting to look like a flywheel now. Looking good. I wasn't super crazy about the finish on the OD, so I got some emery paper taped to a block of wood, and I just polished up the OD a little bit, and the block of wood just helps keep the hot dogs out of the blender. And then as before, the hub on this side just needs facing, and then a little bit of chamfer, and then I did the OD with the boring bar, and I matched the OD of the hub with the other side with that measurement that I took, and again I set the depth of this to where we're just touching the cast spokes there. That should be it for this setup, so I can take it down, bring it back over to the bench, and I know some of you were worried about whether or not there were ridiculous piles of washers involved in this second setup, and rest assured there were.
Next up, we need a set screw at a 15 degree angle in the hub. Something like an angle adjustable fixture plate would be perfect for this. Guess what I don't own? Instead, I'm resting my 90 degree plate on a 1, 2, 3 block, setting it at 15 degrees, clamping it in at a ridiculous angle with a bunch of washers, as is tradition. Presto, 15 degree angle fixture. Now, obviously, this isn't very precise, but it doesn't need to be. The 15 degree angle is really just there to give you clearance on the quill, which I still don't have. I need a longer drill here, so I'm measuring about how much longer I need this drill to be. You can get very long drills, sometimes called aircraft drills, for this purpose, but I don't have any, so I'm going to do something else. Got a piece of drill rod here. Oh, nope. 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 There it is. I need to keep the back of this from flopping around. I don't have one of those fancy spindle spiders. What I do have, however, is a shop rag, and guess what? This works just fine. I'm facing off the end here. Now what I'm doing is just making a simple drill extender. It's going to hold the drill, go in the spindle, drill gets longer. After center drilling, I drill it out with one size smaller than the drill I want to hold in this because drills tend to cut a little oversized and I don't have a reamer the size of a number 38 drill. So drill it a little undersized and then it ends up a perfect fit. And then I'm just going to Loctite the drill in place. Loctite is amazing for quick and dirty fixturing and holding jobs like this. A little bit of that on there, let that set up for 20 minutes, and it's good to go. While that cures, I'll finish fixturing the flywheel here. Now, I need to center drill it, and luckily I do have a very long center drill. This is actually a donation to the channel by a viewer, and I would not have guessed how useful very long center drills are. Just the thing here. The center drill is important here because we're drilling at a slight angle and on top of a convex surface, so the drill would wander off if we didn't center drill it first. If this angle was much steeper than 15 degrees, you'd want to mill or file a flat spot first, but we can get away with this here. Now, I don't have a way to get an edge finder or anything in there, so I'm using this trick of just pinning something straight with the drill, and then you move back and forth until it looks level, and that'll be precise enough for this. Okay, drill extender should be ready to go, and it's an inch too long. When does that ever happen? Well, easy fix. Just got to cut an inch off of it. And well, I don't need both hands for that, so I'll take a coffee break with the other. Challenges of a small mill. I had nowhere to go but down on the column, so that had to be shorter. Now, we've got some run out in the drill there, but it looks like it's going to be okay. As long as it finds the center drill there that we made, it's going to be just fine. And that is drilling very well. Okay, out with the chuck and in with the spring loader tap follower to tap this thing. I've got the Tommy bar and the tap wrench all the way over because I thought I was going to need to move it back and forth because I also don't have pulley taps, which are very long taps. But luckily, there actually was enough room here, so I didn't have to do any of that. I did, however, have to come in with a bottoming tap because my bolt that's going through the hub there didn't leave enough clearance for the taper tap to do the job. And a little test fit with the set screw. Perfect. It's exactly where I wanted that wrench. Now we can take it down and we should be basically done here. Here's another look at that set screw so you can see the 15 degree angle in action there. And you could put that in straight if you had long enough tools, but I don't. Now the drill extender has done its job, so a little heat breaks the 603 out of there. And of course the drilling and tapping left a burr on the inside of the bore there, so I just run the reamer through by hand to clean that up. And now let's do a test fit on the crankshaft. It's very exciting. It's really starting to look like an engine now. Slides on there very nice. Tighten up that set screw, and let's take this thing for a spin. Hey, look at that. It's flywheeling. Now, did I achieve the goal of a flywheel that doesn't look like it's wobbling when it runs? Well, I'm not going to sit here and claim there's zero visible runout in that, but I am pretty happy with it, considering how challenging this casting was to work with. I think it's going to look really great, especially once it's all painted up. So that's all for this part. Thank you very much for watching. If you like what I'm doing, maybe throw me some love on Patreon, and I will see you next time.